How is everyone today? <laughs> so, uh, there's been some online homeworks, there's been some written homeworks. At the present time, Quiz Zero is running, and you've got to do Quiz Zero uh, this week. <coughs> Any questions about that? Yeah? This due next Saturday. Quiz Zero is due in the Saturday that's oh, two days from now. Oh, but Quiz One is due next Saturday. Right. Yeah, quiz zero is the, is the can you follow the directions for signing up for a quiz quiz, more or less. So <clears throat> there's no math on it, but it is for credit. Then quiz one and quiz two open <coughs> on Monday morning, and they're open from Monday morning at open of business of the testing center to the, to the following Saturday, close of business at the testing center. Any question about any of that? <clears throat> okay. So, where did we leave off last time? I think we had just gotten to substitution, right? So then, remember that antiderivatives, antiderivative is the, is the inverse procedure of derivative. It is performing the der it is running the derivative machine in reverse, if you like. Um, that means that for every derivative rule, there has to be a corresponding antiderivative anti-rule. So we've got this thing, substitution, that we're talking about. What, what, is it, what derivative rule does it correspond to? The chain rule. Yeah, the chain rule. So for, for derivatives, we've got this thing called the chain rule. And then for antiderivatives, to undo the chain rule, you use what's called a substitution. OK. So we, we already discussed the, the, ma the main detail. Now what's left for now is uh, we need to practice. So let's do it. So how about? antiderivative of <coughs> 6x multiplied by uh, 3x squared plus 4 to exponent 7 dx. Okay. So, remember that there's really only three antiderivatives that we know in this class uh, presently. So there's the power rule, the antiderivative of x to n dx is x to n plus 1, divide by n plus 1, and then plus a constant. Now, there's a caveat here. When can you do this? When n isn't negative 1. When n is negative 1, you can't divide by n plus 1, and therefore you can't do this whatsoever. So that corresponds to this antiderivative, the antiderivative of 1 over x dx. And what is the antiderivative of 1 over x dx? Yes, log of absolute value of x plus c. And then there's only one other rule that you know. Which one is this? Just one other. <coughs> That one, which I'll just write. I'll do the, e the one that's easiest to write when the base is the natural base. 
The antiderivative of the exponential is the exponential plus a constant. And then when you, for whatever reason, are using, using a non-natural base, then you've got all those logs of the base floating around everywhere. These are the only three that you know. Now, don't misunderstand me and think that this is the only three that there are in the universe, say, because you could crack open a more advanced calculus textbook and just get tables and tables and tables of antiderivatives. What I'm telling you is that these are the only three that we use in this class. So that's good because that means, in, in a sense, like we're, you know, it's, it's, you can kind of play a game of it's got to be one of these three. Is it that one? No. Is it that one? No. You can kind of use process of elimination. Whereas some of the engineering students, they, they're out of luck, right? Because they've got hundreds and hundreds of them. Well, so the procedure that we use to calculate, to compute an antiderivative, okay, goes like this. We have an antiderivative, and we ask ourselves, is this exactly one of these three? No, it isn't. Okay, so, okay, that means that there's something to do. The next question is, is can we perform a sequence of algebraic steps to turn this into one or more of these? Yes. And we actually could, and the way you do it is by multiplying this all out. But who wants to do that, right? <laughs> and then if I was to make it like 700, then for, all, for practical purposes, it would be impossible, right? You couldn't multiply it out anymore. So let's say that 7 is too much. We don't want to multiply it out. What, uh, what does that leave for us? Substitution. So then we'll say u is what? 3x squared, squared plus 4. Now, this is a part where it's good to know what the, the real and true name of something. So this procedure, this, this thing that we're about to do, it is in shorthand called a substitution. But its full name, its long name, is a variable differential substitution. That's what its real name is. Now, this is the substitution that we're going to perform with the variables. This is the variable part of the substitution. But the thing is, is that in this antiderivative, not all the things are variables. Some of them are differentials. What's the differential? dx. dx is the differential. So we need to figure out what part of the substitution is going to end up covering the dx. So how do we, how do we determine that? Mm -hmm. So then du dx is then 6x. And then we can solve for the differential du and get du is 6x dx. So these are the variable. This is the variable part of the substitution. And that's the differential part of the substitution. And together, it's a variable differential substitution. So <clears throat> this stuff in red is going to be covered by the u. All of the stuff in x's in this red box is going to be covered by u's in this red box. Similarly. The 6x dx is going to be covered by the du. Okay. Now, as for the antiderivative, did we cover everything? No, we didn't, right? We didn't cover that 7. Is it acceptable? to have not covered the 7. Yeah. Why is it acceptable? 
Because why? Because it's a constant, right? It's because of the kind of thing that it is. It's a constant. In particular, it's not a variable, and it's not a differential. So it need not be taken into consideration for the variable differential substitution. Right? It would be like, it would be like saying, it would be like telling someone, I need you to paint the fence red, and then, and then they do it. And then you complain, but you didn't paint the tree red, right? <laughs> Well, it's a tree, right? This is a variable differential substitution. That's a seven. It doesn't need to be covered. So, after the substitution, how does it read in terms of u? Mm-hmm. u to seven du. So now, we have significantly uh, changed the antiderivative, which means that we start back at the top of the antiderivative procedure, and we ask, is this exactly one of the antiderivatives that we know? And now the answer is yes. That's terrific. That means that there's no more, that, that, that there's hardly any work to do left. So specifically, the answer will be u to eight over eight plus a constant. And then, is this the answer to the exercise? No, and why not? Very good. So then, finally, the answer will be 3x squared plus 4 to exponent 8, and, and then over 8, and then plus c. <clears throat> Any question about this? Okay, <clears throat> how about <clears throat> how about the antiderivative of, so I'm going to leave myself some room right there and write something in there in a moment. How about 8x squared plus 4x Uh, plus 9 dx. And then what I'm going to write in that little slot there is 8x plus 2. So, we start back at the top. Is this exactly one of the antiderivatives, one of the three that we know? It isn't. Is there something algebraic that we could do, like multiply out a product, or simplify a quotient, or something like that, to turn it into one or more of the ones that we know? I don't see what it is. What, what would you do? Without, without calculus steps, just algebraic steps only, what would you do? I mean, you can't, you can't really get this stuff inside the radical. The radical's a pretty impenetrable barrier. The radical cannot be broken up. So let's, let's clear that error. <laughs> let's clear that error right now. So it is an, it is an error to think. You can do that, but some students, perhaps any would be too many, think that this is true. And this is definitely not true. <laughs> this is big, big no-no. This makes the calculus teacher cry. So I'm not sure what you would mean by break up the, the radical. So, so to convince you that this couldn't possibly be true, how about the square root of 4? I think we can all agree that the square root of 4 is 2. Yet, if this was true, if this were true, 
then you could write that the square root of four, well, that's the square root of two plus two, right? And if that were true, that would be the square root of two plus the square root of two. Right? And then I could, if it worked once, then it could, should work again, right? That'd be the square root of one plus one plus the square root of one plus one. So then that'd be the square root of one plus the square root of one plus the square root of one plus the square root of one. But the square root of one is one. Everyone knows that. So this is four. Right? Please no. <laughs> Okay, so square root cannot, cannot work in this way. So if, there's, if, if this is not one of the antiderivatives, one of the three that we know, and there's nothing algebraic that we can do, then what? Substitution. Now, it seems weird me going through this very short flow chart. But what's going to happen as the semester progresses, substitution is a very big and good tool for the purpose of computing antiderivatives. And we're going to accumulate several more of them, probably three or four more of them. And there's going to be a whole flow chart. We're going to get to an antiderivative, and then we're going to say, is this one of the three? No, it's not one of the three. Can I do some algebra? No, I can't see what I would do with algebra. Can I do a substitution? No, it doesn't look like a substitution. Can I do this other thing? No, it doesn't look like the other thing. And then you just keep going through until you find the one that fits. Okay, so I want to get you used to that language. Okay, so a substitution. <coughs> now let's say that I'm not real comfortable with substitution yet and I say I don't know what should be what so I'll try u is 8x plus 2. So how can I confirm or deny whether or not that's a good guess? Well, how can I figure out if it's going to work, is what I mean to say. Ah, compute the derivative, right? So that'd be du is 8 dx. Now let's look at that. Suppose we were to carry out this variable differential substitution. Would we be able to, c to cover up all the variables and all the differentials with this? Nah, right? Because, for example, we've got that x squared there. What, what would we do? What would we do with that? Okay. So, so this isn't going to work. But I, I, I point this out because many students look at exercises like this and they just try and imagine their way to the end of the exercise before they write it down or something. Write it down. Write it down. Just write down anything and then just check. Because if I wasn't sitting up here gabbing, I could have written these two lines reasonably in about 30 seconds, probably less, right? Okay, so that's not going to work. <clears throat> uh, well, so, so we're not going to do that. Um, what would be another guess? <coughs> yeah, how about all that stuff in the radical? Generally speaking, if you've got a, if you're performing an antiderivative and you've got a radical with a whole bunch of stuff in there, it is very often a good idea to say, well, it would be terrific if all of that stuff was you <laughs> inside of the radical. That's generally a good idea to, to at least attempt. Okay, so then du dx is 16x plus 4 so that du is 16x plus 4 dx. So is that going to work? Let's look at it. I mean, I can see that we're, we're proposing that everything under the radical become u. 
But I don't see a 16x plus 4 anywhere. Ah, so you're saying that if we were to do this, 2 and then 8x plus 2dx, these pieces are the ones we have. That 2 is what we don't have. So let's put it on the other side and say du over 2 is 8x plus 2dx. Okay, that's going to work because everything in this red box is going to become this U. So everything, all of those variables are replaced by that variable. And <clears throat> all that green stuff is going to re be replaced by this. Okay. So what will, what will the new antiderivative be in terms of symbol u? Go ahead and write the antiderivative symbol. <laughs> and what's the other stuff? You still keep it under the radical or can you change it to the one half? The right to the one half? Well, either, either one is fine. Okay. But for purposes of visual continuity, I'm going to keep it as radical. Okay. And, and then in the very next step, right half. <laughs> so I wrote square root u. What else do I need to write? No. I've got to write the differential part, right? du over 2. So now, that division by 2, that's just a, that's just a division by 2. You could, you could reckon that as being a multiplication by half, which could be factored out like so. <coughs> So now we've made significant changes to the antiderivative, which means that it is now time to start back at the top of the procedure and ask, is this exactly one of the three antiderivatives that we know? <coughs> Who is it? It is. Which one does this belong to? The power rule, right, with exponent half, as you said. So, antiderivative of u to half du. We can invoke the power rule. So this would be half u to 3 halves, divide by 3 halves, and then plus a constant. And then resubstitute. question about this one. Okay, how about one last one? <coughs> Before we go to the next thing. Okay, so <coughs> how about the antiderivative of exponential of 1 divided by z and then all of that over z squared dz. Now, don't be thrown off by the z. That doesn't mean anything. 
you could rewrite it all with X's instead of Z's and it'd be, it would be precisely the same antiderivative. I'm just writing a different letter there, primarily so you don't get too emotionally attached to X's, okay, because there's nothing special about X. So I'm going to let you think about this for a minute. Hmm, so it's a little tricky. Well, I like to give this one because it is it does have just a slight trick, but there's really nothing to it. And really, if you haven't done anything, you're making a mistake. And it's not that you're making a calculus mistake, you're making a strategic mistake. You're making a, a mistake of strategy, primarily of not understanding the way that you're made to be honest. And that is that inside of all of our brains, the human brain is a, is a fantastically complicated and wonderful piece of machinery. And we have enormous parts of our brain are dedicated to visual processing. And another enormous part is dedicated to language processing. And another enormous part is dedicated to sound processing. And believe it or not, even though they are, they are each individually masters at their trade, they actually don't talk to each other very well. <laughs> they don't. They don't communicate with each other very well. So computations like this are fundamentally kind of a language thing, actually, because it's a written, it's a written language. And many students try and look at something like this, and more or less, it seems to me, I'm not because I'm not inside your heads, it seems to me like you're trying to imagine how it will look like in the end. And because you can't imagine what it will look like in the end, you never get started. Well, let me give you the trick to get started. Here's the trick. And that it, this is the same with any math problem or any kind of computation problem. You've got to get it out of your imagination. Because the truth is, is that even though it may seem like you're pretty good at imagining, you're not. And that, that's not a, I'm not being down on you as individuals. I'm just telling you that human beings aren't that great at it. Okay? You've got to write, write it down on the paper so that you can look at it. Write down something. And the purpose is, is that part of your brain that's thinking very hard about the language aspect of this exercise cannot communicate with the visual cortex directly. You've got to get it out of your brain, <laughs> through your hand, on the paper, into your eyeball, so that now you have two parts of your brain engaged. Here's the trick. You know exactly three antiderivatives, which means that every question that I give you, I have to constrain myself so that eventually this question will be one of those three. I have to do that. That's the rules of the game. Of the three that you know, of the three antiderivatives that you know, which one does this seem most like? We 
you think? It's got to be a substitution, I agree. But what I mean is that eventually, before, eventually, we've got to do some computation and then eventually come to a point where we've reached one of those three. It's either the power rule, the log rule, or the exponential rule. Those are the only three that we know. Which one does this seem like it's most likely to be? I think exponential, because it has an exponential in it anyway, right? So if that's the case, if that's the case, what I want you to see is it kind of looks like, looks like antiderivative of e to u du. If only because, th and this is just a guess if only because it has an exponential in it. So, if that's the case, and assuming it's true, because we've got to get started somehow, let's assume that that's the way we're supposed to go. <coughs> if that's the case, then let's try the substitution. U is what? One over Z. One over Z. Now proceed as if that's true. How do, you, how do you determine whether or not that's true? Find du. Find du. Well, I'm going to write u in a slightly different way that's more amen amenable to calculus. I'm going to write it as z to negative 1 because then it's slightly easier for me to do calculus on it. In that case, then what is du dz? Mm -hmm. Negative z to negative 2, right? So now I'll solve for du and get negative z to negative 2 dz. Hmm. Does that look good or not? I mean, the fact that the z has a negative 2 exponent, well, how could, how, how could we get it to have a positive exponent? Put it in a denominator, right? So somehow we'd need a z squared in the denominator. Do we have a z squared in the denominator? Ah, oh, we do. So maybe it'll help if I rewrite this antiderivative just slightly and instead of writing stuff in denominators I'm going to write stuff with with negative exponents as necessary so I'll write I'll write that that's exponential of z to negative one and then instead of writing divide by z to two I'm gonna write what multiply by z to negative 2 dz. Okay, now I'll give you a moment to finish the exercise.
Okay, so in the interest of time, du over negative 1 is z to negative 2 dz. So what I'm saying is that I'm going to replace the z to negative 1 with a u. And I'm going to replace the rest of this with a du divided by negative 1. And that covers everything except for e, which is a constant, which need not be covered anyway. So any question about coming to this conclusion? OK. Then this would be antiderivative e to u, and then du divided by negative 1. Well, that negative 1 can come out of the antiderivative uh, because it's a constant multiple. Uh, so we start back at the top of the antiderivative procedure. Is this exactly one of the antiderivatives that we know? It is. It had to be, right? That's the rules of the game. So this is then uh, negative e to u. That, that negative is that negative, plus a constant. And then negative e to uh, 1 over z, and then plus a constant. Any question about this one? So now, even if, even if you, um, <coughs> I'll say it like this. Even if you didn't see it like this, when I see, th when I see this one, this is how I, when I see this exercise, this is how I see it. Let's, let's say that I'm just, I really don't know what to do, and I'm just going to um, start guessing wildly. Let's guess wildly. How, how would it go? Let's go back to here. What if I just say, OK, uh, I'm going to try v, and I'm writing v because instead of, instead of I've already used up u. So I'll try v. Maybe v is the exponential thing. Maybe v will be exponential of um, z to negative 1. I don't know. Maybe it will be. Uh, if that's the case, how can I confirm or deny that that will work? Find the derivative, right? So then dv dz. Derivative of the exponential, well, that's the exponential again. But then for the chain rule, what? For the chain rule, I've got to multiply by the derivative of z to negative 1. Well, what is the derivative of z to negative 1? negative z to negative 2, right? And then I could solve for the differential dv. <coughs> dv, and then I get exponential of z to negative 1 uh, multiplied by negative z to negative 2 dz. And now let's have a look at that. Well, other than that extra negative right there, isn't that the whole antiderivative? It's all of it, isn't it? It's all there. So look, if we were to write dv over negative 1 to get that negative on the other side. And this would be exponential of z to negative 1 multiplied by z to negative 2 dz. And what I'm saying is that this thing alone would cover all of it. 
right. <laughs> so let's just do it. What would happen if we did? What would be the new antiderivative in terms of v? So is it, is it entirely too obvious or entirely too subtle? Because that, that's usually what si silence means in a class. And it's, it's actually quite difficult for me to tell. Is it too obvious what, my, what the answer to my question is or is it too subtle? Too subtle? Do you agree that that all of this stuff is all of that stuff. Yes. Yeah. They're the same. Which means that I could replace all of that stuff in blue with dv over negative 1. Now I think the thing that you might be worried about is that, well, we didn't do any... <laughs> what did we do with that? Well, nothing. That's fine. We just, you just don't need to do anything with it. Because we covered all of the variables and all of the differentials. They're all gone. There's no more z's. It's all v's now. So then we could factor out that negative 1 and get negative antiderivative dv. Well, what is the antiderivative of dv? V. So this is negative v plus a constant. And now we resubstitute. And after all, v was that. And of course, the answers are the same. Exact same. Now, what I want you to see from this is a couple things that I want you to take away from having done this exercise. In the first place, some of the argument can be a little bit complicated. That is to say, when you take it all in one big bite, one big gulp. But the individual steps, none, none of the individual steps are beyond any of you. you all of the individual steps are comprehensible. But even I have a difficult time imagining all of these steps without writing them down. You know, I'm supposedly an expert. <laughs> and, and even if you didn't really know what you were doing, you could, you could in one sense just on accident get it right just by blind guessing. And even you just said, well, uh, let's do that. And then it worked. If you said u is 1 over z, that would work. Lots of things will work. So the purpose of this example is to encourage you, don't sit there, don't sit there and do nothing. It's, and I'm, I'm, I've spent a lot of time saying this here and now because mm -hmm. every time I teach this course, I, I witness a, a large cohort of students, even, the, even good ones, ones who will, do, who, do, who will do just fine in the rest of the semester. They do quite poor here because they keep getting faced with these antiderivative exercises and they just look at them. And they just look and look and look and then end up doing nothing. <laughs> so don't let that be you, is what I'm saying. Any question about this? Okay, so next thing <clears throat> is section 7.3. It is called area and integral. So now, I'm fully aware that this that integral is a word that you're familiar with, as well as antiderivative, because at least we've been talking about it. But and it I would say it's as likely as not that you're, that you're confused as to the, the distinction between these two. 
Okay, so now we're going to make the distinction. So now we're not talking about calculus, and we're not talking about derivatives or antiderivatives. We're talking about some new notion. We're talking about area, and we're talking about something that's going to be called integral. Okay, and so derivative is completely set aside for a moment. And, and because derivative is completely set aside, so is antiderivative. Okay, so before you even stepped foot in this class for the first time, uh, you had a, a lot of named shapes and areas that go with them. For example, you knew what a circle was and, and, the, and the formula for the area of a circle and all, all that kind of stuff. Okay, now I'm taking all of that away. You don't know any named shapes. You don't know any formulas for areas. You don't even know what area is. It's completely blank slate. Totally gone. Here we go. The only thing that we have right here is we have the notion of the, of the Cartesian plane. That's it. That is to say, we have two copies of the reals and those copies of the reals are at a right angle to each other so that we can measure distances horizontally and we can measure distances vertically. And this is all, all that we have. So I'm going to draw um, a shape. And these little boxes that I'm putting in the corners mean that those are right angles. Okay, then we can get out our, our, our ruler. We have a linear measuring device. We can get it out. And let's say that we get, it, we get out the ruler, and it so happens that this, this has length uh, A, and this vertical one has length B. And suppose that for this particular shape, we want to come up with a summary measure for it that says how big it is. In, in the sense of if we were to get out paint, a bucket of paint, how much paint would it take to paint it? Okay. We're gonna, I, I think a good name for that would be area. So we're going to call it area. And then what are we going to use for the formula for the area of this shape? How about A times B? Yeah, that, I like that. But before we get any further, though, I think we should come up with a name. What should we call this? <laughs> How about mm, a right angle? No. How about, <laughs> How about a rectangle? OK, so now we have one shape, a rectangle. Now here's the thing about area, about this summary measure area that is, that is at this point only defined for rectangles. Nothing else, no other shape is even named, and certainly they don't have an area yet. Now here's the thing about area. This rectangle has area AB. So now I'm going to make a new rectangle and I want you to ask, I want to ask you what the new, what the new area is. So this one has, rec has area AB. How about this one? Also AB, right? How about that one? Also AB. How about um, how about that one? Also AB. So what I'm trying to get across to you, what I want you to observe, is that this rectangle. It doesn't matter if I move it over here or over there, or anywhere, that doesn't change its area. And it doesn't matter if I turn it a little bit, that doesn't change its area. And furthermore, it wouldn't matter, it wouldn't matter if I cut this rectangle into two pieces and then moved the pieces apart, the area would still be the same. So this is, this is the, one of the <coughs> defining properties of area, is that it's, is that it's, it's it is a measurement that is invariant under, under moving it around and turning the shape, but without squishing it, right? If you squished it, you might change the area, but I'm not talking about squishes. 
Okay. Let's make a new shape. That's not a rectangle. Okay, a new shape. That's not a rectangle. Well, I guess we should go ahead and name it. <laughs> what do you want to call it? A three-sided. <laughs> Let's call it, how about a triangle? Now, if area sort of intuitively means something like how much paint would you need to paint it, then if a rectangle has area, it seems reasonable to say that a triangle has area. Right? Because if you can paint a rectangle, you can paint a triangle. Yet, we have no idea what the formula may, might be for the area of a triangle. How could you possibly figure it out? But only using the area of a rectangle. Okay. Well, I'm going to make another copy of this triangle so it doesn't, so you can see the original one after I play with it. So what we have to do is we have to somehow relate the area of this triangle back to the area of a rectangle. So this is what we're going to do. When I see that triangle and I look at that one long side that it has, okay, it kind of looks I, I'm kind of reminded a little bit of the long side of a rectangle. Okay, so I'll, what would happen if if we took that to be the long side of a rectangle? That would mean that the other sides would have to be at a right angle to it. The, the other sides of the rectangle, if that's the long side of a rectangle, the other sides would have to be parallel to these. So now, here is one particular rectangle. And that's a big rectangle, and the triangle is in the big rectangle. Now, we could compute the area of the big rectangle. <coughs> And that wouldn't tell us exactly the area of the triangle, but surely the area of the big rectangle would be more than the area of the triangle. Right? Because it's, after all, the triangle is inside of it. Well, let's imagine that this line right here is mobile and I can wiggle it around. I want you to tell me, where could I put this line so that the triangle is still contained in a rectangle, but the smallest possible rectangle? Can you see what you would have to do? Yeah, you take this, you take this line uh, segment and just drag it until you bump the rectangle. And what I want you to see now is that here we have a red rectangle. Now, suppose that because, because it's a rectangle, that means that now we can use all of our rectangle information. Suppose that we measure this to be H and this to be B. Suppose we get out the, the ruler and, and that's what the ruler says. Now, I'm going to make a third line that's parallel to these other two. Make this one. And what I want you to see is that, so this one's parallel to those other two. What I want you to see is that, look at this shape right here. This green is part of the triangle that we're interested in. Right? That's part of the triangle that we're interested in. And what I want you to see is this other piece right here that piece 
if it has an area, has to have the same area as the green piece. Why does this piece have to have the same area as the green piece? Because I could pick up that, that piece right there, turn it, and put it directly on top of the green piece. Right? <coughs> I, could put it, I could put them right on top of each other. And picking up that, or, or if you like, picking up the green one and putting it right on top of the clear one. Picking it up and moving it doesn't change its area. Now, furthermore, this blue piece is also part of the triangle that we're interested in, right? But it also has its counterpart. This, this uh, piece right here is the same, has the same area as the blue piece. So these are the same, and these are the same. So what I want you to observe from this is how is the area of that of the red rectangle related to the area of the triangle in which we're interested? Yeah. Or if you like, the rectangle is exactly twice the area of the rect of the triangle. So what's the area of the triangle then? One half base height. Which of course agrees with the formula that you knew before you got here. But this is why it agrees. Now, I could take a shape. So I'm drawing some line segments, and they're all at right angles to each other. So this is just some random thing I just drew here. Now, this shape is not common enough in human experience to have a name, right? It's not a circle, it's not a whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't even have a name. Okay? But it has an area. And furthermore, using just what's written on this page, we can calculate its area. How can we calculate it? Yeah, we can just break it into rectangles, right? So look. We'll break that piece, and then I'll maybe do that, and that, and that. So I was able to break it into um, five rectangles. Then we could get out the ruler. Then we can measure the, the lengths of, of, of each piece. We can compute the area of the five rectangles, and then add them all up, and that's the area of that weird shape. Okay, so you can imagine, I can give you some crazy big shape where, all, where it's just a sequence of line segments that are all at right angles to each other and then you could cut it up into rectangles. It'd be an incredibly boring task. But I think that you can see that in principle it's entirely possible. Okay. Now here's the problem. The problem that we have to address in calculus. And that is <clears throat> what about if we take a shape where it kind of almost looks like a rectangle. So I drew three sides, and they're all straight, and they're at right angles to each other. And then suppose that this shape actually is going out to a party and puts on a very fancy hat. OK. Now, this is a shape. It's not a common enough shape in human experience to have a name, but it's a shape. And I think we can all agree that it has an area in the sense that you could paint this. But this shape has a problem in comparison to the previous shape because of that red side. That red side is wavy, so we can't break it into rectangles, right? Because, <coughs> because none of the sides of a rectangle are wavy. Okay. Well, we're going to make a we're going to make a slight compromise. I say, okay. I'm going to I'm going to make two copies of the shape.
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it into, into four horizontally equally spaced pieces. I'm going to cut it like this. So. Cut, 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 and for this one the same. So those are supposed to be equally spaced. So now, each one of these little strips, for example, this strip right here, that strip is not a rectangle. It's not. It's kind of almost a rectangle, but the top of it is curvy, so, so it's not a rectangle. Well, I want, for this one strip that we're looking at, I want to fit a rectangle inside of it. So for example, here's a rectangle that fits inside of that strip. That rectangle fits in there. My question to you is, is that the biggest rectangle that, that we could possibly fit in that strip? Is it the biggest one? No, it's not the biggest one. So what I want to do is I want to make the biggest one. In particular, I'm going to take this and I'm going to move it up until I, until I hit the function. And then I'll go no further. So in particular, it will look like this. So that's the tallest rectangle that can fit in there. And now I'm going to do the same thing for all of the other three. I'm going to fit the tallest rectangle that can possibly fit. So now, we're going to play a similar game with this one. <clears throat> so with this one, we still have four little strips of shape, right? That one, that one, that one, and that one. And we're still going to play with rectangles, except now, instead of fitting a rectangle inside the strip, I want to fit the strip inside a rectangle. So this is what I mean. That leftmost strip fits inside that rectangle, right? It fits in there. Now, is that, is that the smallest rectangle that we could possibly fit that strip in? No, we could do better, right? We could take, that, we could take the top of that and we can pull it down until bonk, until we, until we hit the function. Okay, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that for each one. The result looks something like this. The virtue of having done this is that, as for the green, ignoring the red now, just the green, the green is a shape, and we can compute its area, because after all, it is very obviously just four rectangles. Right? Then, <clears throat> because it's just four rectangles, uh, but because of the way we chose them, we could add up the area of the four rectangles for this one, and would that be an underestimate or an overestimate for the true area of the shape? It'd be an underestimate. Why would it be an underestimate? Yeah, because this is, you know, we've got a little crust there, as if this were a sandwich, you know. Children always leaving the crust there on one side. Why always on one side, right? 
the, the, the crust that was to begin with, that was fine, but the, the near crust was fine to eat, but the far crust was not fine to eat? Why is that? I, I don't get that. Okay, fine. So this is an underestimate. How about this one? An overestimate. <clears throat> so, if you had a deck shaped like this, or a piano, or whatever, and you wanted to paint it, well, then you could cut it into four pieces, um, metaphorically, right? Imaginally, abstractedly. Cut it into four pieces, and then measure these four rectangles, or like this. If you were going to paint it, would you estimate it like this or like this? This one, right? <laughs> Why this one? Why is this one better for painting? So you want to go back to the story. Yeah, you don't want to run out of paint, right? <laughs> this, one's the, this is how you run out of paint. <laughs> okay. So you could estimate the area of any shape like this. And you might think, I don't know, that doesn't sound very interesting to me, <laughs> to estimate the areas of shapes like that. Well, I promise you that it happens, that, that you do it, in fact. Some of you are even doing it right now. Okay? Because, for example, this screen, and I'm not talking about what I've drawn on the screen. I'm saying this screen as a device, and in fact, every screen that you look at as a device, uses exactly this trick. That looks like a, ra a wavy red line. But if you were to get right up here next to the screen and look at it, it's not a wavy red line. What is it? It's a bunch of pixels. These are just little squares. That's what they are. I, I'm close enough to the screen where I can see the individual pixels. So this is not, this is not really what I'm drawing on that page. This is, this is actually, that page has been cut up into a whole bunch of little squares, and then the color in each square is constant. And then the squares are small enough that you get the idea. Right? That's all that this is. What I'm telling you is that this idea is not a little idea. This is an enormous idea. This is the way things are made. So the battle cry for calculus is going to... So let me ask it like this. So this is an underestimate. This is an overestimate. Suppose that we stick with the underestimate. How could we make our estimate better? Yeah, we could use more rectangles, right? There's nothing sacred about using four. Why don't we use five? Or five million, right? I mean, that's all that this screen is. But the battle cry of calculus is the following, is that, well, let's just not stop. Let's use as many rectangles. Let's use infinitely many rectangles. That's how many we're going to use. We're going to use infinitely many of them. Okay? So in order to, to get that to work, in order to get that to work, we have to have... Uh, a nice notation to deal with because we're going to be adding a lot of things up. So this is called sigma notation. <clears throat> now, there is a Greek letter sigma. So in particular, that's a capital sigma. Lowercase sigma looks kind of like an O with a hat on it, but that's not relevant. So this is Greek letter sigma. Uh, what, what English letter is phonetically equivalent to sigma? S. So when the Greeks want to say uh, sandwich or whatever, they probably don't ever say sandwich. But, but supposing a Greek wanted to spell sandwich in Greek, 
then it would start with a sigma. Okay. Uh, the reason why we're using sigma here is because we want to add things up, and the fancy name for adding things up is summing them. So sigma, sum, that's the reason for the letter. So we could write something like uh, the following. So Greek letter sigma means uh, is, is how we will denote, denote, sums. So probably best to just do it by example. So for example, the sum from, uh, say, n is 1 to 5 of n squared. So now I need to explain to you what this means. What this means is we're going to take all the values of n that are between 1 and 5. That is to say, we're going to take n is 1, n is 2, n is 3, n is 4, n is 5. We're going to take all those values of n. And then, for each one of them, we're going to produce the expression n squared. So there's going to be five different expressions. There's going to be 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, and 5 squared. And then we're going to add them all up. So what this means is, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 5 squared. So that, that thing on the left hand side means all that stuff on the right. And I think that, I hope that you will agree that the left hand side is nicer, especially when the top number gets big. Imagine if this was 50 instead of 5. Right? Then it would... <laughs> I'd run, out of, I'd run out of page and get a hand cramp writing it all out. Okay, that being the case, would you please write what it means, the sum from n is 1 to 4 of, say, uh, 3n. So I don't want you to, to perform a whole bunch of arithmetic. I don't want you to multiply it all out and all that stuff. I just want you to write down with all the pluses what it would be on the right hand side. So what's the first value of n that we will use? 1. And then what is, what is 3n for that n? It's 3, right? 3 times 1. And then plus. The next value of n is 2. So then what's 3n for that? 6. And then plus. The next value of n is 3. And 3n for that is 9, and then plus 12, etc. Okay, so is this okay? So the sigma notation allows you to concisely, compactly represent a sum. And the purpose of the, the, the reason, the connection for using the Greek letter sigma in the end is because we're making a sum. And Greek letter sigma is equivalent to English S, which is how we start sum, the word sum. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so this, what we're writing here is the definition of the integral. So let f be bounded
on A to B. All that means is that it doesn't have, for example, it doesn't have any vertical asymptotes on, on A to B. So I'm talking about a function that looks like this. The integral is <clears throat> that area. That's what the integral is. Not an approximation of that area, exactly that area. Okay. So what we want to do is come up with a procedure to compute the exact value of that area. Notably, this is a shape. In principle, it could be painted, but it's not common enough to have a name. Nevertheless, we're about, to, we're about to pull a formula for its area out of the air. And not just this shape, but essentially every shape. OK, we're going to say define x0 equal to a xn equal to b Delta x is b minus a over n, and xi is x0 plus i multiplied by delta x. That's a mouthful. <laughs> what does that mean? OK. So let's, let's make it clear what all of this language means. What we're doing is we're carefully making a prescription for how we can talk for all the talk about all the pieces. So we're saying that x0 is a. So in a sense, what we're saying is that we've got this interval a to b. And so that we'll have a consistent notation, we're going to call this leftmost point x0. And we're going to call, we're going to call the rightmost point xn. And what we're going to do is we're going to split this interval, a to b, into n equally sized intervals. So n could be 4, it could be 4 million. Okay? But for purposes of me drawing something definite, I'm going to draw 8 intervals. But you need to understand that this is just a drawing. and there could be any number of intervals. Now, notice that these intervals all have the same length. They all have the same length. What is that length that they all have? They all have the same length. And what, what's, that, what's the name of that unit? They're all delta x. That's what this is saying. The length of the interval is b minus a. So b minus a over n is how long each one of these is, delta x. So they all have length delta x. So we've got this interval a to b. We cut it into n equally sized pieces. <clears throat> now, so that, that covers the first thing, the second thing, x0, xn, delta x. Now we need to talk about why this. Why this? So we could count here. And I could point to a particular, um, to a particular one, a particular one of these points here. This one is x0, and then their names are red proceeding to the right. This is x1, x2, x3, etc., all the way until you get to n. 
So here I'm pointing at, which one am I pointing at? That's x3. What this formula is saying, what the formula is saying, is that to get to x3, the way you get there is you start at x0, and then you move delta x, delta x, delta x. Then you're there. What if you wanted to get to x7? Right. If we wanted to get to x7, then we'd go to, then we'd go to here, the beginning, and then we move delta x, delta x, delta x, delta x, delta x, delta x, delta x. Seven delta x's. And if, if n was really big, like a million, and you wanted to get to x 500,008, well, then you'd go to x0, <laughs> and then you'd do delta x, delta x, delta x, delta x, and keep going to the right one position at a time until you get there. That's what this is saying. To get, to get to x3, you start at the leftmost point and then move three delta x's. That's how you get to x3. Okay? Is x0 plus three delta x's. Okay. So, now in each interval, xi minus 1 to xi. Select a value ci. Now, what that means, I'm just saying, for each interval, for each one of these little pieces, I want you to select a point. And I'm not, I'm not making a prescription as to how you select them. I'm just saying do it in a manner that pleases you. So like that one maybe and that one. The blue ones are the ones that I'm more or less just arbitrarily selecting. So I selected those points. Now, we're not going to talk about how to select them because it's just open-ended. And in this class, it's not relevant. But for those of you who might get really excited about math and say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go for it. <laughs> I'm going to be a math major. OK. Then you're going to have to learn all about selection procedures and things like that. Okay, but we're, we're glossing over the matter. Suppose you select a value ci. then the picture looks like this. <clears throat> so that's the function. What we've done is we we're using that these sample points to cut this area into these little area strips okay and what we're going to do with these sample points is we're going to say that is the value on the function that we're going to use to make the height of the rectangle. So some of these rectangles might be, like we did on the previous page, might be the lower ones, or might be the upper ones, or might be some intermediate ones. So it might be, it might end up looking something like this. Like this, like 
like that, maybe, like that, like that, like that. So you, I'm purposefully trying to draw the rectangle so that so that a little bit they're under, or a little bit they're over, a little bit they're under. Okay. But what I want you to see from this, for example, if this right here, that value would be C in. So if that's C in. Then what's the height of this rectangle? So the input is Cn. The input to the function is Cn. So what's the height of that rectangle? It would be f of Cn. OK? Now, there's n rectangles. Now, really, there's eight, because I had to draw something. But there's n of them. The area of the ith rectangle is, well, let's look at it. Because of the way we selected things, we've already decided that the height is f of ci. Somehow we selected the ci, then the height of the ith rectangle would be f of ci. What's the, what's the width of the ith rectangle? How, what's the base? Delta. delta x, right? They're all delta x. So that means that the base of this rectangle is delta x and its height is that. Therefore, its area is the product of these two f of ci delta x. So that's the area of just one of them. So to get the area of the estimate, of the whole estimate, that means we've got to add up all n of them. So the area of all rectangles is, well, the area of the first one would be f of c1 delta x. That's the area of the first rectangle. Then we'll need to add to it the area of the second rectangle, f of c2 delta x. And then we'll need to add to it the area of the third rectangle f of c3 delta x plus dot, 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 plus all the way to the last one, f of cn delta x. Isn't that a lot of writing? That's a whole lot of writing. Wouldn't it be great if we had some more compact way to express it? It would be terrible if we just omit that. <laughs> Right, we do, right? We've got this sigma thing, right? You could write it like this. The sum from i is 1 to n of f of ci delta x. So that's the area. And this, this would work if you had uh, eight rectangles. It would work if you had 800 rectangles. That, that's the formula for the estimate of the area. OK? Now, suppose that we have some estimate. And we determine, one way or another, that this is not a good enough estimate. We need it to be more accurate. How can we make it more accurate? Yeah. More rectangles, right? Make the rectangles even thinner. And then it, then it would be even more accurate. 
The calculus point of view is let's just use infinitely many rectangles. Now, what symbol, what, what letter represents how many rectangles there are? The N does, right? N is the number of rectangles. So let's use infinitely many rectangles. And the way that you do that is we'll say, okay, let's compute the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i is 1 to n of f of ci delta x. Well, this formula right here, this is the exact area of that shape. This is the exact area. So with a caveat, if this exists, if that limit exists, now the technical part of its existence means that it has to be finite and not depend on how you chose CI. That's a technical matter that we're not really going to get into, but I have to say, because I'm a mathematician, I have to say it. <clears throat> then, two things. One, you say that F is integrable. on the interval a to b. That means that f is a function that has the ability to be integrated. That is to say that the shape that it makes is actually a shape that can be painted. It's a, it's a surprising fact that, that there is actually plenty of shapes that, that are not integrable. They don't have, a, they don't have an area for any well-defined de, well meaning of of area. But they're kind of a, a, um, esoteric in comparison to normal human experience. And two, so that's what you say, then you denote, denote this uh, value, that is to say, of the integral. As, well, the long-winded way to say it is exactly what I wrote up there, so I'll copy it. The limit as n goes to infinity of the sum <coughs> from i is 1 to n <coughs> of f of ci delta x. But that's kind of a mouthful, to be honest with you. Isn't that a lot of writing? It'd be terrific if we had some shorter notation to write this. And this is now the second time that you're going to see this joke, which is basically one of the oldest jokes in all of calculus. So now, we've got these, we've got these letters from some other language, right? What's this letter? Sigma, right? From which alphabet? Greek, right? And then what's that one? Delta. From what alphabet? Also Greek, right? Now here's the thing, here's the long-running calculus joke, is that when you're computing limits of expressions that are using Greek letters, assuming the limit exists, then all that happens is that you switch alphabets from, from Greek to what? Latin. And so here, this is, a, this is a capital sigma, so we're going to change that capital sigma to a capital S, a capital S. And since it's such a big deal, I'm going to stretch out that S so it looks really majestic. Big old stretched out S. And then F of X. Well, I'm going to write X because it doesn't actually depend on CI. And then delta. What's the phonetic equivalent of delta? D. So I guess I'll write DX. 
And since this was over <laughs> the interval A to B, I'll just write that right here. <laughs> it's one of the oldest jokes in, in, in all of calculus, right? This is, this is the second time. We've only been here for four, for four lectures, and I've already made that joke twice. It's a great joke. This, okay, is the way that you denote the integral. Now, I think it goes without saying that notationally, visually, this looks just like the notation for antiderivative. Yeah? Notably, it is not an antiderivative. It's not. Visually, how, can you, how do you distinguish between antiderivative and integral? How do you visualize? Right. With these things on the top and the bottom. If I remove them, then that's the notation for antiderivative. When you add them in, that's the notation for integral. So because they're so similar looking, they must be connected somehow deeply. But right now, that connection is not at all clear or obvious. Antiderivative is running the derivative machine in reverse. Integral is taking a shape, cutting it into infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles, finding the area of each one of those infinitesimal rectangles, summing them all up continuously. That's what integral is. Okay, and then antiderivative is this other thing, running the derivative machine in reverse. Separate matters. But what I want you to connect is the following. Is that here's a shape. Okay, and if that is y is f of x, then this shape is not, um, it's, not a, it's not a rectangle, right? It's not a triangle, it's not a circle. It's not a common enough shape in human experience to have a name. So it, it doesn't have a name, but it does have an area. And we have just written down the formula for that area. The formula for the area is this. So even though it doesn't even have a name, we still have a formula for its area. That's incredible. So now, at the beginning of this section, I took away all the named shapes and all the formulas for their areas, and now I give them all back, right? So now, suddenly, you know what a circle is, and you know the formula for the area of a circle, okay? <clears throat> so here's an example exercise. Here, uh, here's the plot of y is f of x. So from 4 to 3 is that straight line. <clears throat> and then from 3 to 7 is the top half of a circle. And then from 7 to 9, it's that straight line. Uh, 9. And that height is. Three. Okay, 
so nice, uh, <clears throat> nice function there. Give you a second to get it copied. So here's my question. What is the integral from 0 to 9 of f of x dx? How can we go about solving it? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. So <coughs> what, I, what I want you to see from this exercise is that, ah, well, here we have a function. It's got a red. It traces out the red, and then the green, and then the blue. And then the integral of that function's got to be the area that's under those curves. Well, if we just consider the red for a moment in isolation, well, that shape I just colored in, that's a shape that you know. For not only by name, but you also have a formula for its area. That's a triangle. OK, how about uh, the green shape? Is that, an, is that a shape that you know? Yeah, that's the top half of a circle. Do you know the, the formula for the area of the top half of a circle? Yeah, you just take the formula for the area of a circle and then divide by two, because that's half of it. And then the last shape, well, that's the simplest shape of all, right? That's what they're all defined in terms of. That's the rectangle. So we can find the integral by finding the areas of the individual pieces and then adding them up. So let's do that. Well, the red piece, since this is 4 and this is 3, and the formula for the area of a triangle is half base height, this would be 6, area 6. And then we have this circle. Now, its diameter is 4, which means that its radius is 2. So then this would be pi times 2 squared, pi r squared, if it was a full circle. But it's half of that because it's half a circle. <coughs> and then <coughs> the rectangle. as base 2 and height 3, so 6. So the area is the sum of these. So that's pi times 4 over 2, so 2 pi. So this is twelve plus 2 pi. Any question about this example? Now, when we were going over the definition of the integral, there is one item that I glossed over. And that is that when I drew the function, I always drew the function as if, as if uh, it was positive all the time. But the definition of integral actually doesn't depend on this. A function could be negative some of the time. And 
And here's the thing. If, if you have a function and it's negative, and you're computing its integral, the area it's accumulating is actually negative area. And that might disturb you a little bit, but um, I promise you it's completely natural. So for the moment, if you can, suspend your possible revulsion against the concept of a negative area, and let's just go with that, and then I'll give you a, a, a real world instance in which it makes sense. So for example, so maybe we've got one part of a circle here, and that's radius 3. So it's, it's like a circle for that. And then it is like a half circle up to 5. So both the red and the green are parts of circles. Okay. And again, I'll say that this is the plot of f of x. My question to you is, is what is the integral from 0 to 5 of f of x dx? Well, we can use the same trick that we did before. And that is that since this is part of a circle, and since I can see that it's exactly 1 fourth of a circle, then I could compute the area of the red by taking the area for the corresponding circle and dividing by 4. Okay. Then, for the green, I could compute the area of the corresponding circle and then divide by what? By 2, right? Because it's half a circle. But here's the problem. Is that this is the horizontal axis, which means that because the red is above the horizontal axis, that means that the function's outputs are what? The function is positive in this, for this part. And then it goes below the axis, which means that when, it, when the function's tracing out the green, it's actually negative. So this green area, where the integral is concerned, is a negative area. So how will we compute? Uh, the answer to this question. How will we compute it? So while you're thinking about that, I'll compute the the areas of the individual pieces. So this piece, so that would be pi times r squared, since it has radius 3, pi r squared. But since it's 1 fourth of a circle, I'll have to divide by 4. And then the half. That would be pi times 1 squared, because its radius is 1. But since it's half of a circle, I'll need to divide by 2. So how will I take that information and answer the question? So it'll be the red part and then minus the green part. So this will be pi times 3 squared over 4 and then minus pi times 3 squared over 4. 
pi times 1 squared over 2. Because the red part is counted as being positive, and the green part counted as negative. So now I promised that I would try and make sense of, of uh, why negative area is, is, is a reasonable thing. Okay. So let's, since this is the primary consumer of applied calculus is the business school, I'll make a business comment. So um, take a big box or a big box retail or, for example, um, a grocery store even. So grocery stores, they sell produce. And their produce has to be kept refrigerated. Otherwise, it'll spoil. Or at least some of it has to be kept refrigerated. And the whole building has to be air conditioned. Right? So, and, and then they've got freezers where you've got the ice cream and whatever. So, when, when they shut the doors for the night, if it's a business that actually closes for the night, do they, do they go ahead and turn off the freezers and they, they don't turn it off? Or the air conditioners? No, you can't. You can't do that because the product will spoil, right? All the time that you're running the freezers and the air conditioners and the lights and everything else, that's, that's just money, like money pouring down the drain, right? You're, you're, you're using up a resource. And as it happens, places, big places, even places like Walmart, where cash flow is concerned, unless it's a super, super busy Walmart, they're actually losing money in the middle of the night on a minute by minute basis. They're actually losing money. And the amount of money that they lose per minute in the middle of the night might flabbergast you, really. We're talking about hundreds of dollars, even thousands of dollars an hour being lost because they have such a big expenditure uh, to keep that place running. And so you might think, why, are they, why don't they just shutter it up? Forget it. Walmart's not a thing anymore. <laughs> they lose money in the middle of the night. Why, do, why does Walmart keep, keep on trucking? Why do they keep going? Right. Because they make money in the day. And the amount of money that they make during the day is enough to cover the amount of money that they lose at night. It's just that simple. So if you're losing, say, $200 a minute because of your enormous electricity bill, I have no idea if that's even close to reasonable, but just for sake of argument, you're losing $200 a minute. How much money do you lose in five minutes? A thousand, right? 200 times 5. Of course, that's an area. 200 times 5. And then, since you're losing money, instead of calling it, instead of saying you're losing $200 an hour, we could just as well, in a slightly weird way, say you're earning negative $200 an hour. Or a minute, or whatever it was that I said. So if you're earning negative $200 a minute for five minutes, how much do you earn? Negative a thousand. So what I'm telling you is that retail, where if you plot the hour, say like this is hour uh, zero, and this is hour uh, say twelve, and this is hour maybe. I don't know, 8, and this one 20, and this one 24, that is to say a day. If you plot their, their profitability during, uh, over the course of a day, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Walmart's profit curve was something like this. They're losing money all the time until they get to 8 a.m. where they're just starting to break even. Okay, they're losing many dollars a minute for all this time. 
until they get to 8 a.m. and some people start getting in and then, then they're starting to break even. Similarly, at night, around, ten, around uh, 8 o'clock, I guess, then they, they break even and start losing money down here. So they're losing, this is all loss. That's all loss. And that would be accounted as, as negative earnings. But it's all made up for the fact <laughs> that during the middle of the day, they've got something like that going on. And in the end, the reason why places like Walmart stay in business is because the green bit is more than the red bit. It's just that simple. So, any question about this? Now, we've got this thing, antiderivative, and we've got this other thing, integral. Antiderivative is running the derivative machine in reverse. Integral is running the derivative machine, uh, sorry, integral is cutting up areas into infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles and adding up the areas. But they're connected under some special circumstances. And the connection is the name of the next section, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, a couple, a couple things. So in the first place, I'd like for you to note just how bland typical names, the, the typical blandness of names, that, of things that mathematicians give names to. For example, what's the name of the rule that says how the derivative interacts with the product? The product rule, right? Not, not real decorated. Uh, name there. But, but notice the name that all mathematicians agree on for this. The fundamental theorem of calculus. It's pretty fancy, right? This theorem is, is the um, this theorem, it's not too much to say, is the most beautiful theorem in, that you will see unless you go on to be a math major. Okay, this is the top experience. Okay, so here we go. Fundamental theorem. Suppose the following. Suppose one, that f is integrable on interval a to b. So that is to say that f, when you draw it, gives a shape that in principle you could do that procedure. You could cut it into rectangles, let the number of rectangles become infinite, and calculate the area in that, in that way. And two, that big F is any antiderivative of little f. That is to say, that if you differentiate big F, you get little f. Now that's how you write it with derivative. How do you write this same sentence but with, with the antiderivative symbol? So now, let me explain to you what these two things mean. So what, what this means is that suppose that we have a function little f that satisfies these conditions. But let me, uh, before I write the conclusion, I want to tell you what this means. What this means is that suppose that we have a little f that is very well organized. Suppose we have a little f that is 
very well behaved. A very well behaved little f. So well behaved that it's integrable and has an antiderivative. This little f really has its act together. Then, the integral of little f on the interval a to b is the antiderivative evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at a. Now, I'd like to impress upon you just how incredible, incredible of a statement that this is saying. Remember what the integral says. It says that, OK, we've got some function here. An integral is saying that if you want to make sense of it, you're going to have to cut it up into pieces. OK, cut, 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 cut. <coughs> and you're going to have to be all concerned with all these rectangles and all the stuff that's happening inside of here. So we're cutting it up into pieces, finding the areas of the pieces, summing them up, etc. We're, I mean, you're entirely in every bit of business that this function is doing. You want to know everything that's happening in here. Whereas the fundamental theorem is saying, the fundamental theorem is saying that if little f really has its act together, if it's a really well organized function, then you don't have to measure anything in here at all. You don't have to do anything in here. You just have to take its antiderivative and measure it in exactly two places. The leftmost point, the rightmost point, and subtract them. What it's saying is that instead of having to get inside of this shape and do stuff inside of it, you can, do, you can figure out everything that you want to know by just measuring it on the boundary. This is, this is like the fundamental idea of all of science, to be, to be honest with you. One of them, anyway. A very high one, very high idea. So here's an example. Suppose that you went to the physician, the medical doctor, and you said, um, Doc, I'm not feeling well, and I need your help. And the doctor said, OK, first things first. Lie on the table, and I'm going to cut you open. <laughs> right, what? <laughs> no, 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 how about, how about we do something else first? How about you, I don't know, take my temperature? <laughs> right? Do something that you can, you can measure from the outside, right? Don't open me up yet. <laughs> the only time that the physician opens you up is when something's horribly wrong, right? That's the only time. That's the only time. And that's, that's because human bodies are very well organized and very well behaved. You don't need to, you don't need to open someone up when they go to the general to, to, to a GP and say, I'm sick. And the GP says, well, let me see your throat. Uh, OK, you've got a throat infection. Here's some penicillin. Right? They don't say, OK, stay still while I dissect your lung. Right? They're not going to do it like that. Okay, that would be terrible. That's what this is saying. If you have an integral to do, you don't need to open up that function at all. If the function is well behaved, you can just measure it in these two places, and that's sufficient. So I hope I made the point clear of just how impressive the result is. That being said, we can do a, a few examples. Uh, but I need to make one quick remark. <coughs> the notation uh, I won't write F. big F, and then a large vertical bar, and then 
A down here and B up here. This notation means, that's called the evaluation bar. You evaluate F at B and then minus F at A. So it's just a bit of notation that's in common use. So for example, please compute the integral from 1 <coughs> to 4 of 3t uh, squared dt. So now, one thing you could do in principle is you could plot 3t squared on the interval 1 to 4. And then you could start carving it up into rectangles. <laughs> and you could answer the question in this way. And it would work. But please don't, right? Please don't. Please use the fundamental theorem. The, quest, the, the question of whether or not you can use the fundamental theorem more or less comes down to this. Here, we have an integral. Why is this notationally definitely an integral? Because it has limits, right? If you cover them up, then that notation means antiderivative. The question of whether or not you are allowed to use the fundamental theorem is, more, is equivalent to asking, can I do that antiderivative? Do I know how? So in this particular instance, do you know how to do that antiderivative? Yeah, you do. So let's do it. So what is the antiderivative of 3t squared dt? t cubed plus c. Now, if you go back to the previous page, so I'm, I'm going to write that, and now I'm going to make a comment. The fundamental theorem said, suppose you have any antiderivative, any one at all. Now, all of the antiderivatives are the same except that constant, right? So for example, one of the antiderivatives of 3t squared is t cubed. Another one is t cubed plus 7. Another one is t cubed minus 48. But for the fundamental theorem, you only need one. You only need one of them. So I'm going to choose the one when c is 0, so I don't have to write c at all to make my life easy. So the answer to the question is, I'll take that antiderivative, the one with c is 0, and then evaluate it from 1 to 4. So what's the answer? 63. Any question about this one? Right. So if you like, you could say, if, if you wanted to, you could say t cubed plus c. And then we'll evaluate this from 1 to 4. This would be 64 plus c and then minus 1 plus c. And the c's cancel. <coughs> Any question about the opening example? Okay. So how about Example, the integral from the natural log of 2 to the natural log of 8 of e to 4x dx.
Okay. Well. The question comes down to, supposing we cover up <coughs> the limits and consider the corresponding antiderivative, do you know how to do this antiderivative? So how do you do it? So some of you, I suspect, can probably just blurt out the answer for what the antiderivative of e to 4x dx is. Can any of you do it? Whose derivative would be? Well, uh, let's, let's look at this for a moment. Sometimes it's easier to think of it like that. What if you were differentiating that? What is the derivative of that? e to the 4x, and then multiplied by 4 for the chain rule, right? So its derivative its derivative would be e to 4x times 4. What's its antiderivative? E to, e to 4x times 1 over 4, yeah. E to 4x divided by 4, yeah. So. This would be e to 4x over 4, and then evaluated from the natural log of 2 to the natural log of 8. And then now can we, can we evaluate this? Let's see. So that would be 1 fourth. Uh, Oops. So exponential of <coughs> 4 log 8 over 4, and then minus exponential of 4 log 2 over 4. Well, as a matter of curiosity, what is the exponential of 4 log 8 anyway? How can you compute it? I claim it's something that you can do in your head. How can you do it in your head? Well, isn't there a log rule that says, what can I do if you ignore everything else except just 4 log 8 for a moment? What can I do with that 4? <coughs> right. I can bring it inside of the argument to log and say that it's 8 to 4. So like this, the exponential of log of 8 to 4, and then all of that over 4. And similarly for this one, the exponential of the log of 2 to 4, and all over 4. Well, what is the exponential of the log of 8 to 4? It's 8 to 4, right? Because when you do because logarithm and exponential are inverse functions. So this is 8 to 4 over 4 and then minus 2 to 4 over 4. Now I don't think I can do 8 to 4 in my head, unfortunately. You have it? What? OK. 5, 6, 3, 2. Like that? Or is that the whole answer? No, that's just Is it really? That's not a power of 2, though. Okay, that's better. That makes, that makes more sense to me. <coughs> 4, 
four zero nine six over four minus I can do that one sixteen over four. So then the answer is what? Forty eighty over four. So one zero two zero. Interesting. Okay, well, that's all the time that we have for today. So have a nice weekend.